The Being an Engineer podcast is a repository for industry knowledge and a tool through which engineers learn about and connect with relevant companies, technologies, people, resources, and opportunities. Enjoy the show. But in, in the lab, we're able to take his brain signals and decode them into uh, enough uh, information to allow him to do things like pick up a glass now, animate his arms, pick up a glass. Uh, he can play Guitar Hero. Uh, with this system set up, and, and so the technology is pretty amazing. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Being an Engineer podcast. We're speaking today with Bill Atterbury, and if that name sounds familiar to you, it's because he has been on the show before. There was so much more I wanted to cover with Bill that I invited him to a round two, and he very graciously accepted. So for those of you who haven't heard Bill's episode yet, I'll do a quick intro for him, and then we'll jump into some questions. Bill holds both bachelor's and master's degrees in mechanical engineering, and notably has worked at the same company, Battelle, for 40 years. He has spent his career designing and developing new products, largely in the medical device space. He is a Battelle Distinguished Inventor, and in 2013 was named Battelle's Inventor of the Year. Bill, welcome back, and thanks so much for joining me again. Thank you so much, Aaron, and thanks for having me back. It's a pleasure. So tell us... Tell us a little bit about Battelle. I mean, you've been there for 40 years. It must be a pretty incredible place. What What is Battelle? Well, it's a very interesting and unique organization. Um, a little background on it. Uh, this may re- cover some of the earlier stuff uh, that people have, may have listened to. But uh, uh, Battelle was started by a fellow by the name of Gordon Battelle. And he and his family were uh, Central Ohio industrialists. They were kind of focused in the area of... Um, uh, mining and coal and steel, uh, primarily in central Ohio and other areas as well. And they amassed a good bit of money as part of that. Um, and, uh, this was in the early 1900s, uh, when Gordon was around and, uh, um, Gordon died kind of early, uh, but left no heirs. So, uh, in his will, he had the vision to, uh, create an organization. He saw a need, uh, for companies who, uh, didn't have large R and D organizations and didn't have, uh, extensive laboratories, uh, and, uh, had no place to go to when they had problems, technical problems that needed solved. And of course, at the time, the focus areas were in the area of metallurgy and, uh, those areas. And so his, his thinking at the time was, well, here, here we need to set up an organization that can, uh, uh, do this kind of technically challenging work in areas that, uh, companies need it. Uh, but don't have it available to them and, uh, set up the organization as, as, uh, as part of his will and his trust. And, uh, it's an organization. So it's, we're, we're nonprofit. And, uh, the, uh, will says that uh, all of our net profits go to, uh, uh, charities. So that's what we do with our, our net profits. You talked a little bit about Battelle being this organization that maybe not all companies have the resources to do uh, a particular R&D effort. And so that that's that's where Battelle comes in. So how does that work between Battelle and other companies? D- does Battelle license certain technologies to other companies that aren't, you know, can't afford to develop it themselves? Or, or is it a different type of model? Uh, we have a number of different ways of working with, uh, our clients and our clients are government and industry, uh, primarily government, but, uh, industry as well. Uh, and, uh, I, I, I'll call our bread and butter, uh, business is a uh, fee for service. So, a uh, client will come in with, uh, an objective, uh, uh, the classic one is, okay, here's a medical device that I want designed. Can you guys uh, design it for us and get us, uh, into production with this? And they give us a set of requirements, and you know how it works in the medical industry. Uh, you know, you work uh, t- towards those requirements and doing the development, uh, design, and analysis, and testing along the way. And then, in the end, you uh, um, do the ver- verification and validation to get the product launched as a medical device. So that's our classic bread and butter. We just charge our cost plus fee for that. Um, and that's the primary way that we make money. Um, we do have opportunities to do uh, royalty and licensing work for 
uh, technology, technology that's developed in-house internally. And I'll talk about one of those in a minute. And, and that's, uh, okay. uh, uh, that's the Xerox, uh, uh, um, case study. Uh, but, uh, primarily we're fee for service yeah. and there are a number of these other, uh, areas where we can license and make money that way as well. Great. Great. So Bill has several, uh, I don't know if case studies is quite the right word for it, but topics that we're going to cover today. And these are all projects that Battelle has done. Um, uh, they're really interesting work and I'm excited to, to dig into them. Before we do, I, I have one more question about Battelle and, and how you work there. So Battelle is a, uh, not for profit organization. How, how does that change the culture at Battelle or the way that you work as an engineering team when you, the team isn't really motivated to generate a profit? Certainly you're motivated to not lose money because you need to, you know, reestablish those, those, uh, the, the piggy bank, so to speak. But, um, how, how, how does that change the culture not being profit driven? Um, it, it's interesting. Uh, we do not uh, operate quite like a research, like a, a university or a, a academia would, would operate. Research for the pure purpose of research. It's usually applied. And um, we, we, we uh, don't have traditional, you know, we don't have an owner. Uh, obviously, clearly, he's no longer with us, uh, Gordon Patel. Uh, we don't have shareholders. Uh, so we don't have to have quarterly, uh, you know, uh, every quarter, uh, post our profits. Uh, we do have to sustain our business and grow it if we can. Uh, and that's kind of our goal is to sustain and grow. And so we, we always want to be, um, relevant and, uh, busy working on things that are relevant to society and making a little bit of money along the way because the more money we make, the more we can give away to charities. So that's kind of the focus of what we're doing. Um, and we, uh, we don't, <laughs> certainly we don't, uh, look to lose money. We like to make money. Uh, and when we do that, we can, we can grow and then support our charities. Fantastic. <clears throat> How big is Patel? How many people work there? Wow. It's a good question. Uh, there's a number that in this, we're based in central Ohio, in uh, Columbus, Ohio, central Ohio area. And there's about 2000 in that, uh, region but oh, about six thousand overall so wow. uh and there's okay. a number of offices around the country um we we uh we count some of our employees as the ones that work at pacific northwest national labs uh those are our employees we do manage a number of other labs uh under uh consortium agreements uh uh, and we don't count those as our employees. Okay. All right. Well, let's dig into the meat of this episode. You mentioned Xerox. Let's start there. We've got uh, six or seven topics that we're going to discuss, but let's start with Xerox. What was Battelle's involvement with Xerox? Well, Xerox is an interesting technology. I think everybody knows what Xerox is and what it means. Um, uh, this goes way back uh, to the forties uh, when, uh, um, there's a fellow, a very sharp fellow, Chester Carlson is his name, who was the inventor of the Xerox process. And Chester, uh, was a, um, patent attorney. And he spent many, many long hours, uh, copying <laughs> drawings, uh, and patent applications by hand. And you can imagine how painstaking that would be. And, uh, he is the one who came up with the basic process of how to do, uh, copying without using photographic processes. Uh, so yeah, he had applied for his patent in, I think, the late 30s uh, and uh, tried to peddle it to uh, primarily the photographic companies. And they were like, well, why should we have this? We've already got this great business built on photographic uh, methods. And, and you know, what, what do we need your, <laughs> your technology for? Um, and so he, he struggled a little bit with trying to get people interested in it. And uh, it was kind of a happenstance meeting. Uh, he was meeting when, with uh, one of the Mattel officers on another topic. And uh, it's one of those things like uh, you kind of get done with your work. And at the end of the meeting, he says, hey, I've got this interesting technology. Do you know of anybody who'd be interested in it? Uh, and uh, 
and we looked at it and we said, well, that, that is interesting technology. And, uh, you know, it wasn't developed at Battelle, but uh, uh, it is something that uh, kind of is right down our alley in terms of some of the challenges that you see with it. Um, but we, we didn't uh, have the money to invest in it either at that time. But we basically said, well, you know what? We will work with you on this to commercialize it, develop it to the point where it can be commercialized. And uh, as part of that, we'll, we'll take a fraction of the ownership of the technology. And uh, what, Chester, go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt. <clears throat> what did the technology look like at that point when, when Chester first approached Battelle? Was it in any form that we would recognize now as Xerox or was it completely different? Um, it was what he had done, uh, obviously created the process and had it documented quite, quite well. But uh, he had working in his little attic lab in Astoria, New York, uh, took out a piece of wool and rubbed it on a glass plate to charge it up. And then he would expose that to an image. And then he would dust some carbon carbon on it and then blow it off. And uh, hmm. he would capture that image and he'd press it onto a piece of paper. And that was kind of where it was at. And you know, it, was, it was all the right steps and all the right things, but n- nowhere close to anything that could be commercialized uh, uh, that Got people it. could okay. use. Uh, it, it did lack a number of, uh, you know, areas that, that, that were a fair amount of work to get, to get, um, get working. Um, and that's kind of where Battelle comes in. Uh, so he came to us and he said, okay, well, you know, let's, let's, uh, let's see if we can't do this jointly. And, uh, uh, the first challenge we had was, um, you know, the powder didn't stick to the glass very well and it didn't hold a charge that great. And, uh, it, it, it. When you expose it to light, it, it didn't get that great of an image. Uh, so our first challenge was to come up with uh, a coating for that. And being a materials uh, company, um, metallurgy and materials, we, we understood the materials pretty well and the processes pretty well. And we kind of took a nine, uh, a uh, Edison approach to it. We just basically tried all sorts of different types of materials and processes. And we landed on an amorphous selenium coating. Uh, and we applied that by vacuum deposition, which, you know, that, that took a fair amount of trial and error work to get to, but we found that I it was bet. a great, yeah, yeah it, it was a great semiconductor and, uh, it took a charge really nicely. And, uh, and then, you know, where it got exposed to light, uh, the charge was, uh, uh dissipated and, uh, it held up to the subsequent steps very nicely. And so, um, it's kind of funny copiers even today have that very similar coating made out of selenium in them. A lot of them do. There are wow. some new ones too, but, but that's kind of stood the test of time. How interesting. So, um, Battelle was really the organization then that, that took this, what it sounds like was very bare bones technology and made it into what we recognize today as a, a copy machine. Well, it, we got it close. <laughs> um, okay. the other area that we worked on quite a bit was, uh, uh, Chester had just used like carbon black, which is a great way to, you know, create an image. But a- a- as you know, uh, you pull a non, uh, finished paper out of a copier and it's, it gets all over your hands and it just smears. And, and so the toner is the other part of the equation for Battelle's contributions. Ah. And so we took that carbon black and, uh, we put it on a very finely milled, uh, polymer that then could hold the charge carbon dissipates charges. So we need something that would hold the charge, but also uh, would have the carbon black in it so that we could transfer it to a piece of paper and melt at a low enough temperature we could fuse it to the paper and basically make a permanent record. Uh, so that was the other the other key uh, contribution that we had made to that. Uh, to this day, pretty much they use the same sort of technology for toner. And like it or hate it, it's, <laughs> you know, because nobody likes dealing with the toner packages. Um, and then where that ended up for us was uh, we helped them develop the first commercial copier, which was the Xerox 914, and it was launched in 1959. So uh, overnight success in about 10 years. And um, we have one of these Xerox four- <laughs> 914s in our lobby. It's a very interesting piece of equipment. You might think, oh, that's great. You just put your paper in, it comes out. Uh, not so much. <laughs> it is a, a unit that's, uh, I'll call it a, about the size of a desk. Uh, sits on a table, and it had two units. One was the exposure unit, uh, where you'd capture the image and shake, you'd shake the uh, toner on top of it. Um, 
And then you would take that out and put it into a, a, another machine that would then, uh, you know, process and fix the, fix the image. And, uh, it took between a minute and two minutes to make one copy out of this thing. So it was, oh, wow. it was very so rudimentary. You spitting out 40, 60, 80 pages a minute back then. <laughs> there was no document feeder in this one. So it was one at a time and a very <laughs> manual about 10 steps to the process, uh, of getting it, you know, from one image to, to another piece of paper and, and finishing that off. Okay. And who finally took it into, uh, commercialization? I mean, who, I, I, Xerox was selling these companies. So, uh, did it go from Battelle's labs back to Xerox? And then, and Xerox is the one who put it on the market and started selling. Well, uh, c- kind of like that. Uh, there was a company called the Haloid Corporation. And, uh, their business was primarily in the photographic, uh, copying means. And they were, uh, forward thinking enough to, to, uh, entertain a new technology. And, uh, so what we ended up doing at about that point in time was licensing it to the Halloid Corporation. And, um, interesting. They didn't have any money either. Nobody had any money. <laughs> uh, so he said, okay, well, let's, let's, let's take, uh, our payment in terms of stock. And, uh, Chester obviously got a lot of stock and, and, and Battelle did too at the time. Um, and at first this, and, and they, they did launch with this, uh, this Xerox, they call it Xerox 914. It was called Xerox, but it was the Haloid Corporation that was the one who was doing it at the time. Uh, got it. And, and uh, we, we launched with that and it was a horrible failure. And people were like, well, I'm not going to buy that. That's too expensive and it takes too long. And, and, and why should I, you know, waste my time and money on that? So they decided to, um, basically place the copiers and charge per copy. And I don't know how much they charged, but, uh, what they found was that, uh, it really changed a lot of the way things worked in the office. And now you could have hmm. multiple copies of anything. You know, obviously you had a mimeograph machine and you could get copies of type things or you could make carbon copies of things, but you couldn't take a document and make a copy of it. You, you, yeah, if, if you were around back then, I know you weren't because you're too young, but, uh, usually you'd get something that would get circulated from office to office to office and, and they'd have a list of people and you just check your name off as it goes around. And the very one on the bottom might be a month later until they see this, this document. Oh, wow. Now, uh, somebody could take that and make a bunch of copies of it and everybody could see it in, you know, 10 minutes. So it was like, oh, now make me a copy of that and ka-ching. And so they started generating a fair amount of revenue because, uh, they, they charged per copy because, you know, they really kind of had to invent the market. And that's, as you know, if technology is one thing, but if you got to invent the market too, uh, that's another challenge as well. Uh, yeah, and, yeah, and that's eventually a whole it became in and of itself. Yeah, eventually it became so popular that Haloid says, "Well, nobody knows what Haloid Corporation is," and they just changed their name to Xerox because that was their uh, oh, lead, interesting lead, lead okay of the company. So okay, so Xerox was not Chester's company; it was the, the no. Haloid Corporation, and they changed their name. That's correct, and uh, yeah, and uh, and he was able to obviously. Uh, you know, cash in on a lot of, uh, op, uh, a lot of stock of what ended up becoming Xerox, which is, you know, back in that time, uh, grew, grew quite a bit. He, he was actually, uh, uh, a, a very philanthropic person as well. And, uh, he used to say, I hope to die a poor man because <laughs> he spent the rest of his life basically giving away his, uh, <laughs> uh, his riches. Yeah. Oh, well, that's terrific. All right. Well, let's move on to uh, the next topic here, which which uh, you phrase as the sandwich coin. I don't know if that's um, a term that's used at Patel or if this is a general term that I should understand that I just didn't pick up on. But can you tell us a little bit what what is the sandwich coin? Uh, the sandwich coin is uh, work that we did for the U.S. government, uh, Department of Treasury, uh, back in the '60s, and uh, basically the challenge was okay, the coins there, and I'll mainly talk about uh, quarters and dimes, they were made of silver. And they were solid silver. And uh, the government, even at that time, was saying, uh, you know, these are getting really expensive to make. We can't afford to make these out of silver anymore. Can you can you help us out? If, if a quarter were made out of silver today, it would be six bucks, to, just in the silver cost. Wow. Like a, and a dime that would cost two. things into perspective. So, you know, 
clearly not sustainable. <laughs> We'd all be uh, out yeah. melting down our quarters and dimes uh, <laughs> to cash them in. Uh, so uh, that, that's obviously not a sustainable condition either. So they came to us and said, okay, you're used to, Aaron, you're used to requirements uh, from, from uh, other clients. And they say, okay, you got to make something that's the same diameter. It's got to look the same. It's got the same thickness. It's got to have the same weight, but it's got to cost a lot less to make. Can you do that for me? And that's the challenge. <laughs> so uh, we. So it becomes a material science problem. Yeah. Yeah. And a manufacturing problem too, because you got to figure out how to make it. So we came up with uh, uh, mm. the nickel copper sandwich, which is why they call it the sandwich coin. Uh, so copper in the middle and nickel on the outsides. Nickel gives it strength and uh, corrosion resistance. And um, obviously the copper is less expensive, not, not, not really cheap these days. Copper is pretty expensive <laughs> even these days. Um, but then that got implemented in both the quarter and the dime and they, they launched that back in 65. So anything that was minted before 65 would be out of silver and anything after that. And what challenges did your team run into, um, with, with this project? Well, primarily, uh, obviously getting, getting the, the sheet, uh, material, uh, made basically the co-rolling process to make the sandwich part is, is, uh, is the key. Once you figure out you can do that, then now you got to figure out how to get those things put together and the processes necessary to, to create that material. So is it's not just nickel plated. There's a sheet of nickel that gets rolled across on both sides of the copper and they're, they're fused somehow. Yeah, that's correct. It's not, not nickel plated. Uh, it's just, it's three sheets uh, squeezed together and a high pressure roller uh, that fuses them together. And that's about all I know about the process, but uh, uh, I'm sure there's somebody out there who knows. <laughs> and was th- was the nickel used because of um, you know anti corrosion properties? Is that the purpose for the nickel? Uh, uh, yeah, of course, it's got to balance the weight out, anti corrosion, and it's still got to look like a quarter. So it's got to be silver in color and and durable. Uh, mm, and actually, okay. the nickel's more durable okay. than the silver yeah. was. Uh, do you know how much the, uh, the the material cost is today? For you, you mentioned before that a quarter would be six dollars if it was silver. What what is a quarter worth today? Do you know in just material cost? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, obviously there's some you know material costs and scrap, and you know the, the presses aren't free yeah. either. So I I don't I don't know what the right what the costs are. I mean, I'm gonna have to look m- that up more than afterwards. Bitcoin. I'm curious now. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole other conversation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, let's um let's move off on to the next one then, the the first UPC. What was Batella's involvement in that? So, we uh developed the first UPC code and now it's ubiquitous. You see it on everything in the store. I see something on the shelf that doesn't have it. I put it back cuz I know it's going to be a long <laughs> a long trip through the cashier line if I don't have a UPC code on on whatever I'm buying. Um but we did this work originally for the Supermarket Interest Institute. It's, it wasn't government. The government didn't have the foresight to do this. The grocery stores themselves, you know, they that sure that'd be cool, but they don't have the resources to do it. So uh, the Supermarket Institute, which is a consortium of grocers, uh, got together and said, you know, this is something we could really use and really need, and had the vision to to, to create it. Um, the actual Twelve-digit code that you see today was one of uh, a number of. Uh, you know, we asked we asked the industry for proposals, and uh, it was one of a, n- a number that were submitted. Uh, the winning one by IBM, but we did the v- development on that and on the systems that go around it um, uh, to create that. And uh, a little bit of history there. The first product was a st- uh, stick, uh, a juicy. Juicy fruit gum case, stick, you know, packet of juicy fruit gum, uh, and it was sold in a store in Troy, Ohio, and that was that was a big deal back then, um, in 1974. And uh, you know, I saw these when I was little. It's like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Who, who, who needs that? And, you know, you just go to the cashier, you hand her a dime, and and you say, okay, you're good to go. And um, but the reality is, as you can see now. Everything is built around that as a way to keep track of your product, to price it, to, to, to uh, right. you know, obviously Inventory. scan it very quickly. And, uh, you know, the self-scanners are, are, are a great uh, um, 
way to leverage uh, improvement and and getting people out the door. Um, and then you look yeah. at companies like you know what Amazon. What does UPC stand and, for? Um, Universal Product Code, I think. Universal Product Code. Look that one up. Okay, I've I've been curious about this in the past. How uh, how universal are the universal product codes? I mean, if I'm in a grocery store, let's say I'm in an Albertsons in California, and there's a certain UPC code on you know box of cereal or something, and then I'm in a Fry's supermarket in uh, New York, and I pick up. Uh, the, the same box of cereal is, is the UPC going to be the same on both or is it like institution specific, like supermarket specific? Oh, I think it's standard across the industry. Um, because the manufacturers have adopted it, uh, of the, of the, of the uh, products they're selling. And, uh, okay. And somewhere there's this list of what that all means. I mean, obviously you read a code and it traces back to one specific product. Uh, uh, I don't know if it's international or not. So there's got to be some organization that keeps track of this massive database of UPC codes. And at some point, a product is going to become obsolete and removed from the market. And so I guess whatever organization this is just um, uh, allows that UPC code to become uh, available again to be applied to another product? Is that how it works? It's a good question. I don't know how it works. It's way down <laughs> in the bottom of some computer code yeah. somewhere. Uh, I, yeah. I assume they obsolete yeah. them at some point in time, but if there's product in the pipeline, I think you got to keep track of it, right? <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. So did Bat- Battelle also develop the scanners? I mean, I, I guess the the UPC code itself is not all that useful without the scanner, right? Right. It's a system, as you can imagine, and obviously there's compromises in the UPC code. Uh, and if you'll notice, and and I'm sure you you, you have, uh, you know, in in addition to the linear uh, pattern they have on there, there's also a a number that you can read, uh, mm-hmm. a human readable number that goes on that. And so the the real key is coming up with something that can be easily read by a machine, a laser scanner. And in the early days, that wasn't easy. Uh, so there was a lot of concessions made to the scanning techniques and the technology used for picking up that uh, that, that information. Uh, nowadays, I think it would be a lot easier to, to get away with more. But kind of developing that whole system, as far as the scanners themselves, we didn't do the scanners, but uh, uh, we came up with the methodology to read them. Got it. Okay. Uh, so the the individual bars in these UPC codes, they uh, something about the, I guess the number of bars and the spacing between bars and the thickness of those bars. That unique combination is what is what designates it as this twelve digit number. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. I don't know all the details, but yeah, the bars and the widths and the number. Yeah. At all, so, okay, and that's a, quite a number of uh, obviously combinations of uh, of products. Uh, Twelve digits gets you gets you. That's a lot. A lot yeah. of products. <laughs> yeah, what, that uh, 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 like hundreds of billions. I think yeah. that's yeah. where it ends I up. Do the math. Ten to the twelve. Twelve digits. <laughs> oh, even more. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, um, anything else that that we should go over about the UPC codes? No, that's all I had. I just, you know, can't imagine, you know, if you've been through a tour of any of the, uh, uh, Amazon facilities or, uh, companies that, that bring stuff in and figure out where to put it and ship it back out, the fulfillment organizations, uh, they just have stuff stashed everywhere. And it's like, how do they keep track of all this stuff? And, and, and yet yeah. they do and, and they do it in a very efficient manner. So, uh, it's pretty yeah. impressive. Okay. What can you tell me about the golf club swinging machine? So this is one we developed uh, for Spalding. Um, so the, the Spalding came to us and said, uh, you know, we'd like to have a machine that we can use then to test our equipment. And, and can you can you come up with that one? It's like, okay, we can do that. And, you know, the golf swing is so fluid, it, we didn't even know where to start. Just like everybody else, they design. You know, the first person to design an airplane made it look like a bird because birds can fly, right? So, so we we did the right. same. We did the same thing. We went out and uh, uh, invited a bunch of uh, world class pro golfers to come in 
and and spent uh, a couple of days videotaping them uh, from all different angles to get the mechanics of their swing. And uh, the one that we picked that we patterned the machine after is Byron Nelson. So the machine got called the Iron Byron. And if you want to see images of nice. it, uh, you can search Iron By- Iron Byron and and you'll see what that machine looked like. Um, it's before computers. Uh, it was all pneumatic. Uh, kinematics were fairly simple and straightforward, but uh, uh, you'd charge the system up with air, uh, compressed air, and of course, you know, you can get a lot of power out of compressed air. So it ended up being uh, a very repeatable uh, way to test golf clubs and golf equipment did you ever pit uh, uh byron the golfer against iron byron the machine and see who could uh, hit a ball farther a ball farther i yeah i no, we didn't uh, uh but the machine clearly can <laughs> sadly can, can, can <laughs> didn't want to embarrass byron maybe <laughs> and and more precisely it, it doesn't go from t to pin very uh elegantly but uh, <laughs> uh you know it, it uh, as far as hitting a golf ball goes um, it was pretty good at the, it, it, once again, this is another classic, uh, uh, business failure. Uh, Spalding thought, well, they're going to, you know, create a business around testing, uh, all sorts of golf equipment. And now that they got this machine, they reached out to all the other people in the industry and they said, Hey, you know, uh, we've got this machine. Uh, do you want us to use it to test your, your clubs and your golf balls and all your equipment? And, and they came and looked at it and they said, why would we want to do that? You're our competitor. <laughs> we, we, we're not going to give you our equipment to test. <laughs> and uh, and then they said, uh, "But can I buy one of those machines? <laughs> can I mm, can I have one yeah. myself?" And uh, so it ended up being uh, not a great business for Spalding, but uh, they ended up selling a fair amount of machines to other people who could t- use it to test their own equipment. Okay. Well, at least they got to sell some of these, these machines, right? Recoup some of that investment. Yeah, there was a little bit of money there. Um, the machines could, uh, swing pretty comprehensively. They, they, they were known to break a number of, uh, golf clubs. Uh, we had, uh, set it up at one oh, of the wow. local golf courses and invited, uh, some of the local pros around to, to come in and, and the news organizations to, uh, to film it. And so when they were setting it up, they pretty much had broke every golf club that they had brought with them. And, so I know Jack Nicholas was one of the pros that we had there, and uh, his his wife rounded up the other golf wives, and uh, they they scoured the uh, local golf shops for for drivers, so they'd have enough for the demonstration. <laughs> <laughs> would, would the machine just swing the club so hard that it would it would break on contact with the ball? I, I don't know when it broke, but it you, you could dial it up to to do anything. So uh, and it turns out wow. the weak link was the golf club. So. Uh, they they did break a number of golf club shafts. That sounds like a, a really fun project. That's one I would have loved to work on. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, we got a, just a few more topics here. Um, the next two are not really Battelle specific. Uh, they're not even project specific. But over the past forty years, you have developed quite a bit of of uh, industry knowledge and wisdom, and hopefully, we can tap into some of that with these next two questions. What are some things that you didn't learn in college that uh, you have since learned just on the job that have turned out to be pretty important? Well, well, the first thing, uh, you know, when you come out of college, they prepare you quite well. Uh, you, you know, you've got all this knowledge stuffed in your brain and, and all the courses and and you make it all the way through the program uh, and uh, you think you know everything. At least I did. And uh, the first thing I learned is that's that, that not was the case. not me. I did not think <laughs> not I the learned case it. at all. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you, you know, you, and then you find out that uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it's a lifelong learning process, and and uh, I I guess I wouldn't give that up for anything because that was the fun part. It is the fun part today. Uh, so I think you know the first thing I learned was, um, you know, I I, I learned to keep learning. Uh, and I and I learned that uh, you know you can solve any problem you want. You just gotta apply what you've learned and and stick with it. Um, I think think other things I've learned since uh, you, know, you know the classic one is uh, you know there are fairly simple models for say friction. Friction is a friction coefficient times the normal force, and 
and uh, and then you get into the real life, and there are so many other things that affect it. Uh, uh, that uh, you know, you st- stuff like that. It's just like well, you can go a lot deeper, uh, and it's it's not quite as simple as yeah. maybe maybe the simple equations might suggest. Yeah, yeah. Um, do any examples come to mind where you had to go a lot deeper to figure out a solution to a problem than just the kind of the standard easy equations that you learn in college? Um, we do a lot. I think you're involved in this too. Uh, we do a lot of injector devices and they all have springs in them. And a lot of your fixtures have springs in them and the spring, idealized spring is very simple. Uh, it, you know, you just squeeze it and it's linear and, uh, you get your spring rate and you size your spring, make sure you don't violate any stresses and you're good to go. Yeah, and negative KX, right? There you, there you go. There you go. Straightforward, right? You just, that works for everything. Yeah. And then you learn that, well, they're not quite as simple as you might like, and that can cause you problems. So the first thing you learn is, well, when you squeeze it, it grows in diameter. It's like, oh, darn it. I didn't allow enough space for it, so now it's binding up. And then mm. you squeeze it, and it tends to, to, to wind up. And it tends to twist a little bit. So the things that I'm pushing together now want to turn as well as <laughs> <laughs> and then you get long skinny springs and they're like a snake they don't they don't want to compress at all they want to wiggle and so yeah. now i have to line it up somehow and keep it constrained and and so when i'm done i got this spring <laughs> it's nowhere close to ideal because it's grown and twisted and snaked and <laughs> <laughs> that's a good example yeah. All right. How about uh, common engineering mistakes? What, what are some mistakes that you see engineers making quite frequently that um, that we can learn from right now so that we don't make those same mistakes ourselves? Yeah, that's, I got so many. Uh, <laughs> there's a challenge. Uh, the, the first one I'll throw out is is just materials in general, and and uh, we do a lot of work on materials, and and, and you do too, and uh, and how you characterize those materials. Particularly polymer materials, and uh, you, you know you, you you design it what you think are you know linear properties, and then you find out later those were typical properties, and uh, they're they're not quite maybe what you designed to, and it's like oh no no you don't get hmm. that that's just maybe what you know what they might do, <laughs> and oh by the way we <laughs> test them under very yeah. ideal conditions and. Uh, uh, so that's that's kind of one area that we've we've learned that uh, is always a bit of a challenge is you know, understanding and characterizing your materials really well. Yeah. Okay. Anything else come to mind? Um, yeah, there's a few, and and you kind of got to get into specific projects to to go after them. Uh, you know, I see it today. Uh, you know, you've got these really cool CAD tools, and you can design anything that's of any shape. And they look really cool. It used to be designed things that were flat and square and, and blocky because that was easy to put on a 2D drawing. Now, now you've got, you know, all, all, all the, uh, all the reins are off. You can design anything you want, make it any shape you want. And that's great. It really looks cool. And we've even got the technologies now to make any shape. You know, you don't have to worry about molding it or machining it with the standard machining and molding methodologies. You can print it. So now I got this crazy shape that's uh, now printable and it looks great. And then the challenge becomes is, okay, now I want to manufacture this. And now I want to dimension it and I want to put tolerances on it. And I want to know, you know, what shapes will work and what shapes don't. But the shapes are hard to define. You know, I know what they are. I defined them once, but I didn't define the limits of what was acceptable and so now the challenge becomes is, well, now how do I manufacture something efficiently that's, uh, uh, I can say, yeah, that's a good part. That's not a good part. This is not acceptable. How to communicate that to the people mm, that are making stuff right. like that. Especially if you have a really organic shape, right? Then it becomes very difficult to define what those boundaries are. And and we see the need for that all the time. So these complex shapes, yeah, there's a lot of things that need that, that use that, take advantage of it. Uh, there are a lot of good reasons to have it. It's just now you got to deal with how to make it and how to manufacture it consistently. 
Yeah, who wants to deal with that? Let's just go back to square blocky shapes. That's a lot easier. <laughs> we'll design everything to look like a brick and be three times larger than it needs to be. So, <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> this is never going to fail. <laughs> All right. Um, last, last topic here before we finish up. Uh, Battelle Neurolife. What can you tell us about Battelle Neurolife? What is that? That's a... Uh, uh, a project that's ongoing, it's current, and it's been going on at Battelle for uh, a number of years, and uh, uh, it, it's it's really cool stuff. He- heavily in the medical area, uh, essentially, uh, we are working with uh, OSU doctors and have uh, at least one person that's gone through this. Uh, name is Ian Burkhart. Uh, if you want to look him up on the web, you can. Neurolife or Ian Burkhart, and uh, Ian is a uh, quite a pretty quadriplegic and so has no use of uh, our arms or legs and with the help of OSU doctors planted a chip in his brain and are able to get uh, signals of his thoughts of moving his limbs and then uh, the the challenge of that is now you got to hook it up to a um, uh, an electrical stimulation sleeve that then activates his his arm his hand muscles to do things that he wants done and the magic sauce in that whole thing is you've got tons of signals, uh, and you've got to figure out how to decode those into individual um, muscle uh, activations. And so, you know, when Ian's hooked up to this system, and it only, he only doesn't lab. It's a laboratory-level thing. It's not something that uh, is, uh, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not something anybody can do. It's, it's not something that's done outside of a lab setting. Uh, but in, in the lab, we're able to take his brain signals and decode them into, uh, enough, uh, information to allow him to do things like pick up a glass now, animate his arms, pick up a glass. Uh, he can play Guitar Hero, uh, with this system set up. And, and so the technology is pretty amazing. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it really is. And it's like, well, okay, you severed your spinal cord and, uh, you know, it's essentially, it's a bypass, but, you know the bypass is yeah. <laughs> it's very complex and uh so now the equipment that Patel has developed is acting effectively as the spinal cord right well that's yeah it's basically doing the bypass operation uh, of the spinal cord taking the signals yeah, that generated right. by the brain and translating them into signals that then can activate his arm with so uh, it's it's that's because cool the stuff. muscles still work perfectly fine Yep, you just yep. can't get the signal from the you brain right. to the muscles. Exactly, and of course, if you don't use the muscles over time, they don't, uh, you know, they get weaker. But the uh, atrophy, uh, yeah. right? Yeah. So yeah, if you can if you can do that and get the signal to the right place on the arms, pick out the right signal, uh, and you know, of course, wow. there's all sorts of calibrations that are required, and you know, every time they set it up, it's uh, yeah, uh, it, it's it's very intensive as far as <laughs> dialing in uh, the kind of signal patterns. Um, but we started off with something that looked like, and, and the That's key there, incredible that it obviously is latency. You know, you, you, it, it's got to happen pretty quick. Uh, but we started off with some pretty good sized hardware that does that. It's still external, obviously. It'll never be, you know, something we can implant. But um, and it reduced the size. Never of that say never. Point. Yeah, yeah. Well, someday maybe, but <laughs> it's a long yeah, ways off. Someday. Yeah. Huh. It's incredible that it can be done with such um, granularity as to give him uh, access to to uh, drink out of a glass and or play a video game. You mentioned Guitar Hero. That's really, really impressive. How long did it take to develop the technology to that point? Wow. Uh, it, it's been years uh, for sure. Uh, and, and, and even Ian has been working on it with, for years uh, as part of that. And I, I have to give him a lot of credit because uh, – you know, you think, oh, you got this neat system and it just works. Well, a lot of it is Ian figuring out how to make it do what he wants it to do. So he's adapting to it as much as it's adapting oh, to him. Oh, right. Yeah. Right. So you give him some exercises to do and it probably doesn't work right at first, but then he figures out how to move a dot on a screen and, uh, and then, okay, now he's, he's figured that out. So it's, it's kind of a, mm. uh, yeah, it kind of works both ways. He's figured it out as much as, <laughs> as everybody else has. Um, but it really is neat technology. Yeah, yeah. So the the uh, brain activity that he had in the past to lift his left arm may not lift his left arm now. 
he might have to wiggle his right toe and, and that lifts his left arm. I, I might be exaggerating a little bit, but that's kind of what you're saying, right? He's had to kind of rewire the way he thinks. I think there's a little bit of both. Uh, and I'm not the expert on this, but, uh, uh, you know, I think there's a little bit of both where he's kind of figured out what, what things he can do to make it give him the result he wants. And we've sort of figured out how to take most of what those things <laughs> that he's thinking about and translate them into electrical signals for, uh, for removing his, for moving his arm. What, what does that, uh, uh, human machine interface look like between Ian and the equipment that Battelle has developed? Is there like a, a matrix style plug in the back of his head and you hook it up there or, uh, what does that look like? Yeah, essentially the, the chip was implanted by these OSU docs and they, they obviously looked for areas that were, uh, you know, he, he you know, uh, it was placed in areas that they knew were, uh, the motor skills. And specifically the motor skills of what we were trying to control. And, and essentially you're right. It is just, it's just hardwired to a connector that's on his head. And, um, wow. and then, you know, we, we plug into that and read the signals and then generate the simulation <laughs> for his, for his, for his arm cuffs. That is just that's so wild. I, I love it. Um, what does the chip look like? Is it, is it like a flex circuit that wraps around a lot of different folds inside the brain or is it just a, a small little square? Um, I, I do, I don't know that much about the chip. It, it is a small little square. It's in one location. It's not, uh, it's not a bunch of them in, in, in different places. It's, it's one, but it's got a bunch of different, okay. uh, receptors that they can pick up a number of different signals, uh, from that. And it's just hardwired to a connector. Amazing. Just amazing. Wow. Yeah. It's pretty stuff. Uh, we've, we've been kind of moving on, uh, a little bit and looking for applications, for example, stroke rehabilitation. Uh, and in those cases, uh, we, you know, it'd be really scalable if we didn't have to implant a chip in somebody's brain. So we were looking at ways to, uh, read signals <laughs> externally, uh, and, and help, uh, people like stroke rehab victims if they can get to a point where they can start moving their limbs. Uh, apparently that accelerates the uh, recovery process from strokes. Uh, so, so that's kind of the yeah. area. That well, we what do. a cool sneak peek of the, the future of medicine here. Um, I imagine that there are going to be a lot of people listening to this who think to themselves, wow, Battelle sounds awesome. I would love to work there. How, how do people get a job at Battelle? I mean, it's a pretty good sized company. What, what, what's the, uh, what's the process for applying to work at Battelle? Well, it's similar to many companies these days. Uh, just go to Battelle.org and uh, look for careers. Uh, all of our applications are done online, so uh, uh, you'll submit an application that way and get you into the system. You'll see what kind of job openings are available there and uh, what opportunities. And we're looking usually for a broad range of, uh, of folks, uh, you know, not just in the medical area, which is my area, but uh, also in other areas. So a lot of science, technology, engineering sorts of uh Types of folks, and and of course all the support personnel that you need as well. I mean, we we don't do it by ourselves for sure. There's a lot of people that uh, make our jobs a lot easier to do. And does Battelle work with folks remotely, or do you have to live in a specific area? Um. Uh, well, as you know, with the way things have gone over the past almost two years, uh, uh, we are doing most of our work remotely. So we're we're mostly working out of our homes for the folks who can. Uh, and uh, I, I think we are obviously working for clients that are remote in many places. In many places, so a lot of our work is done remotely. And I think we're more open now to people who are able to work remotely and. Uh, uh, support our, our, us. It, I, you know, it, we'll, we'll see what the future brings. Uh, we, we like to be in the office together because, uh, you know, it really helps us, uh, uh, kind of, you know, manage our day to day activities and we use it to kind of build on each other's ideas. And it's easy when you're just walking down the hallway to bounce something off of somebody. Uh, so I, I know we'll go back to that at some point in time, at least in a hybrid mode. Uh, but, uh, we do find ourselves working more with people who are located remotely. Uh, so I don't think that that's a limitation anymore. Uh, obviously you, yeah. know, you can't run a test <laughs> in a, in a, in the lab if you're doing that remotely, but, uh, uh, there's a lot of things you can do. Absolutely. Yeah. We, we pipeline has historically been remote. Uh, all of our team members have worked from home offices, you know, ever since 
the beginning of pipeline. So we, we worked from home before working from home was cool. And, and then ironically, uh, towards the beginning of COVID as, as everyone was leaving offices, we moved into our first commercial space. And, um, and so now we're kind of a hybrid approach where we're sometimes we're in the office and sometimes we're still working from home. Uh, I tell everyone to core value number two is governed by productivity, not bureaucracy. And so I tell everyone just work wherever you're most, most productive or wherever it's most productive for the project or the team with whom you're working. Uh, but I have noticed personally, and this is coming from someone who I tell people, Jokingly, but only a little bit jokingly that I don't like people that much. And I, I, I like, I like being alone. Uh, I, I like, I enjoy having quiet time by myself very much, but I've noticed that I've really been enjoying going into the office and seeing my team and just being there. There really is something, um, almost magic about being in a space with, uh, like-minded people who are focused on the same outcomes. Uh, I, I think that there, there definitely is, um, a benefit to that. So, uh, we have the, I think the, the best of both worlds right now where some of our work can and is done remotely and other of the work is done in person. So that, that's a pretty good deal, I think. Yeah. And I have to think we're about in the same boat, uh, some more than others, depending upon what your role is. Uh, uh, I, I'm with you. I, I can be very effective working from home and getting stuff done. Obviously, meetings now are not a problem to do from anywhere, which is a, a great leap, uh, I think, because <laughs> it doesn't restrict uh, how you can do that. Uh, and then, obviously, there's other things if we're doing, you know, tests with uh, equipment that's, you know, five tons, it's not going to transport very easily. So that's work that's done in the office, as well as some of our other lab work that gets done in the office and and then I think the, the creative aspect too is, is really kind of nice. You can't quite schedule everything on a Zoom call. So it's kind of nice to have, you know, folks around to, Hey, what do you think about this? So bounce stuff off of them. For sure. Yeah. Yep. Okay, Bill. Well, thank you so much for joining me again. This has been a lot of fun. Is, is there anything else that we haven't talked about that you think we should? Um, no, I, I think we're good. I got a couple of anecdotes with the xerography stuff. Uh, you know, Battelle, uh, like many companies, uh, rewards the key contributors and or inventors of some technologies that are gen- royalty generating for Battelle. Uh, and uh, so as a result of that, there was a, uh, a couple of people that were involved in that project. Uh, one, one was, uh, uh, you know, we reached out to a uh, OSU linguistics professor. And how, how should we name this technology? And, uh, and he came up with the term xerography, which in Latin is dry writing, which makes total sense, shortened to Xerox later. And, uh, when, hmm. when he did that, they said, well, that, that's great. You know, we'd like to, you know, uh, reward you for that. Um, we can either offer you, offer you a hundred dollars or some Xerox stock. And, uh, <laughs> and, and of course, please tell me he took the stock. <laughs> and of course he said, well, you know, I need a new pair of shoes. So <laughs> I'll take oh, the hundred dollars. No. <laughs> <the $100. laughs> and, and the other one was a fellow, oh. um, similar story. I uh, hope they were really nice shoes. Yeah. Yeah. I hope so too. So other one was a, a, a fellow that, uh, you know, was on that original team and he used to join his coworkers for lunch and he'd brag at lunch about his million dollar house. And, uh, and so after about the third day of this, his coworker said, Ozzy, you know, you got a nice house, little, little, uh, you know, two bedroom brick flat and garage out back in a neighborhood, not far from here in Clintonville, which is a suburb of Columbus. And he says, it's nice, but it's not a million dollars. So what's the deal? And he says, uh, well, you know, I had just gotten married. I was looking to start a family and I needed a down payment. So I sold this stock for the down payment on the house. <laughs> had I kept the stock, <laughs> it'd be worth a million dollars now. Oh, so. well, hindsight is twenty twenty, isn't it? If only there were a way to know beforehand. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Who would have wow. thunk? Yeah, right. All right, Bill. Well, thank you again so much uh, for joining me again. I, I really appreciate you hanging out again on the Being an Engineer podcast. It's good to be on. Thank you for having me. I'm Aaron Moncur, founder of Pipeline Design and Engineering. If you liked what you heard today, please share the episode. 
to learn how your team can leverage our team's expertise developing turnkey equipment, custom fixtures, and automated machines. And with product design, visit us at teampipeline.us. Thanks for listening.